Today, we're going to look at implicit operators in C Sharp, and I'm going to walk through an example of where I was using implicit operators to try and create something like a multi-type class. So usually when we're talking about implicit operators, there's a lot of people that are pretty hesitant to use things like implicit operators in C Sharp, and I'm one of them. I actually haven't ever had a use for them, and then recently I was trying to play around with them a little bit because I was curious, and I came up with a pattern that I was actually pretty happy with. So I'm going to walk you through my pattern using implicit operators, and then I'm going to show you how I'm using that in some of my other code. So to start, let's actually have a look at the syntax that we need to use for implicit operators. So for the example that I'm going to walk through today, the implicit operator syntax you can see right here is going to have public static implicit operator. And then actually what we're doing with implicit operators is type conversion. So what we see highlighted here where it says tried X and then a generic type here is actually going to be the type that we're casting to implicitly. So to give you some context, I mentioned that I was trying to create something like a multi-type. And what I meant by that is a single class that could actually hold one of two types of objects. So there's already NuGet packages that exist that do some of this magic for you that kind of give you this opportunity to have something like a one of type of class. And this way, like as the name suggests, you're able to have one of one of the types that this class supports. For a lot of what I do, I like to play around so I can learn for myself. So this class that we're looking at that can have multiple types, you can actually see them right here. What we're going to be doing is having a class that can take in a generic non-null value, or it can take in an exception. And if you're looking at the naming convention that I'm using, you might be catching on here that what I'm trying to create is something like a return type that can either be the value of the function that I wanted to calculate, or an exception if something bad happened. So the implicit operators that I wanted to work with were converting from the type that I want my object to be able to hold converting from an exception that I want my object to be able to hold. We'll look at an example that actually shows the use case for both of these implicit operators. If you imagine a function with tried x and the generic t parameter here, what we're able to do is actually return something that is just the value t or return the exception. What's really cool about this is we can just return either the type t or an exception without having to write out the code to go create a new instance of this object. It will just implicitly convert. It does, in fact, actually create a new instance, and you can see right here in both these operators that it is, in fact, calling the constructor. The other implicit operators that this supports actually work the exact opposite way. So given one of these tried x generic t types, we're actually able to take the type t value directly off of it or take the exception directly off of this. So if you think about the person calling the function, they can actually get the exception or get the type t directly off of this return type. Together, all of these kind of create something that feels a little bit like when you make nullable types and you're able to check to see if it has a value or actually take the value off of it. Let's just quickly have a look through the rest of the class and then we'll go to look at an example of how this is used. So this class just has two constructors and really we're just able to pass in either the value that we're interested in or an error. And again, keep the use case in mind that this is going to be used as a return type for functions when we want to be able to return an exception or return the actual value from the function. In either case, we're only setting one of either the error or the value for this object. The remainder of this class, aside from the implicit operators, is primarily just being able to pull the actual value off of this. And if we look at the implementation for this property, if we actually have an error, then we throw an exception and say, you're not supposed to be grabbing the value directly off of this because this did experience an error and therefore there is no value. This particular implementation that I made does not support nulls directly for this object. So if you are somehow able to construct one of these with a null value, I do have a bit of a sanity check here that says that we shouldn't be able to do this. But otherwise, we're going to return the value. These are just implementation details for how I wanted to make this class. It's not really important for the implicit operator part. I'm just demonstrating what I was putting together. The other two properties, just to quickly mention, are the exception that we can pull off of this object in case there is an exception, and then a quick Boolean parameter that just says whether or not there was an error. So if there was no error, right, it's set to null here. What we're able to do is just have a quick check to see if this result was successful. 
So before I jump into the code that I'm actually using in some of my applications, I just wanted to show you a quick little class that I made that actually wraps some of this functionality and makes calling it a little bit nicer. This pattern that we see on the screen here from lines 88 to 102 is essentially something that I found myself writing a lot all over my code. Personally, I know a lot of people will say don't use like these Pokemon handlers, right? You got to catch all the exceptions. But I actually find myself writing code where I want to be able to catch exceptions and log the information that's happening. And generally what I might do is then throw the exception or handle it some other way. But generally I have something like logging. And because I do that, I wanted to create this pattern to make it a little bit more generic. If we think about the implicit operators that we were just talking about, we can notice that on line 88 we have the return type that is tried x with a generic t parameter. And what we're going to be doing is calling some function. And the idea, as the name suggests, is we're going to get the result of that function or the error that occurs. If you look at line 94 and 95, we can see that we're actually just getting the result of the callback and returning it. And this is the success path. So if this all works and there's no exception thrown, great. We just return the result, which is, if we look at the callback, it's just of type T. The implicit operator is actually allowing us just to return result, which is of type T. And you'll notice that type T is not the return type here. So the implicit operator allows us to do this nicely. The last part, just the catch with this error callback. And like I said, I might use this a lot of the time just for being able to log. This catch block, you'll notice, actually returns the exception. So if you look at line 95 and line 100, these are returning two different types. And again, the implicit operators kind of give us this cool functionality where we can return a tried XT as the type of the function, but the individual returns that we're doing are one of the result type or an exception. So hopefully that explains the implicit operator part so far. You might not like this type of pattern, and you may not want to use something like this in your code. But for me, I found a lot of the time I was trying to avoid basically just throwing exceptions and parsers, but I still wanted to have a bit more information about why my parsing failed. So instead of just returning a true or false value, I actually wanted to have something like an exception. And because my parsers are often dealing with information that I'm not really controlling, I also wanted the ability to say if something bad happened and I do want to catch an exception that actually occurred, I can go ahead and log that, but still make sure that my parser can return the exception and not totally just blow up. A lot of the time, I am just trying to parse as a best effort. So let's walk through an example where I'm actually using this tried x type here. Recall that I mentioned I'm often using it for things like parsing, and in this case, I'm also using it for things like converting. I'm attempting to make a conversion here. There's going to be some cases where I actually can't control the input properly, and as a result, I want to do a best effort, but I still want to have information about what went wrong when it went wrong. You'll notice here that I have a asynchronous task that is going to return a tried x with a double. So in this case, in a, the happy path, I'm just going to be returning a number, but in the failure case, I'm going to return an exception. This particular method is trying to convert a number between two different units. So for example, if you wanted to convert grams to kilograms, pounds to ounces, milliliters to liters, that kind of stuff, that's what this method is trying to do. The first part of this function, you'll notice that I'm just trying to go to a repository, look up a particular unit, and then if the result of that lookup is that I did not find something, I'm actually just going to return an invalid operation and actually provide the information about what went wrong. You might say, well, why aren't you throwing an exception here? And my reason for that is that throwing exceptions is really slow. For me, I wanted to see if I could stop throwing exceptions everywhere, but instead try to return them if I could get a performance boost and organize my code in a way that was a little bit different than usual, but still felt nice for me to use. The second part of this function is doing something very similar. I'm just trying to look up the destination unit that we're trying to convert to. And again, if that fails, I'm able to return this invalid operation exception. And you'll notice that by returning these two exceptions on line 218 and 208, tried x 
is actually the return type. So we're using implicit operators to get that nice syntax for free. The other way that we would normally do this is really just say return and then wrap this invalid operation exception in an object. But I like this syntax because it just makes it look nice and clean, in my opinion. If we go to line 222, you'll notice that we actually have a very similar pattern occurring. It's just that we're calling another function called tryConvertAsync that actually is going to give us a result that is of type tried double. In this particular case, I have a slight variation of my tried x class that doesn't return an exception, but instead it will just give us a true or false along with the type that that function can return. You'll notice that on line 228, I'm actually able to say with this exclamation mark, not conversion result, which is actually the same as saying if the conversion result is not successful, right? But if you recall, I had implicit operators that could do some conversion for us. In this particular case, the slight variation, I can implicitly convert my result type to a true or a false depending on the success. For the tried x example that we looked at, instead of converting to a true or a false, I can convert to the exception automatically, and I had another success property in addition to that. So if we look at the last little bit of code in here, in my opinion, this is pretty cool because you can see quite close together that we can either return an exception or we can return the result of the conversion. Line 230 and line 234 are different types, but the implicit operator allows us to convert to the returning type that we see up here on line 197. And as I create this video, this method is actually a good candidate for that safely class that I was showing a little bit earlier that allows us to actually wrap all of this in a try catch with a callback for logging. Again, the takeaway here isn't necessarily that I'm just trying to show that I'm getting rid of bubbling up exceptions by being able to return them as a type. I just wanted to show you what the syntax looks like when you're using implicit operators to be able to do this type of return to a single type, even though you're returning two potentially different types. It's totally okay if you disagree with the entire concept that I'm doing for try, catch, and returning the exceptions. I get it. Not everyone's going to like that. But I wanted to try playing around with that. And in my use case, I've actually found it to be really helpful. And it's all doable because I was able to use these implicit operators. So to summarize, what we were able to look at was a class that using a couple of implicit operators we could actually convert between two different types that this class would wrap. We looked at some syntax for functions where the return type was this class that we looked at that could hold one of two different types. And then we could see that the different returns within the function, we never actually had to go manually new up a new instance of this return type, but instead we could return directly one of the two types that this other class could contain. We briefly looked at the implicit operators that work the other way, and the one example there was I had a return type that could implicitly convert to a true or false depending on the result of that function, if it completed successfully or not. So I wanted to share that example with you because personally, I haven't really found any reason to use implicit operators, but when I went exploring to go play around with this, I thought this was a pretty cool use case. I am using it in my code, and I found, for me at least, it's helped clean some things up with a little bit of cool syntax. I'd be curious to hear from you in the comments if you found any use cases for implicit operators, because I'd like to go explore that too and maybe learn a little bit more for myself. Thanks so much for watching, I hope you found some of this informative, and we'll see you next time.